You're watching Linking History. Today, we're looking at the debate over Indian indentured labour in Australia and the Indian labourers who were transported across the British colonies from the mid 1830s to the early 1900s. After slavery was legally abolished in the colonies in 1833, indentured labour was introduced to meet the high demand for workers. The indenture system involved recruiting bonded labour for contracts of roughly five years to be transported to various British colonies to work on plantations or construction projects. Known pejoratively as coolies, the system also transported large numbers of Pacific Islander and Chinese people and forcibly employed Indigenous Australians. In the 1830s, colonial Australia was in flux. No longer was it just a place to drop convicts, but instead a land of opportunity for farmers and businessmen wanting to make a fortune. While convict transportation slowed, the demand for labour grew. Indentured labour had proved lucrative in Mauritius, and it didn't take long for entrepreneurs in Australia to seize the possibility. In 1836, former Mauritian resident J.R. Mayo and Bengal indigo planter John Mackay petitioned the New South Wales Parliament to subsidise Indian labour immigration as a solution for the labour shortage. They were keen to import what they called hill coolies or dangurs, members of numerous indigenous communities in the area around the Chota Nagpur Plateau. Mayo and Mackay positioned the hill coolies as docile, naive people who were unacquainted with luxury and patient and tractable. This made them the perfect labourers, being cost-effective, hard-working and willing to put up with dire conditions. Mayo and Mackay believed hill coolies to entertain no prejudice of caste and religion, unlike Hindus or Muslims, meaning they would turn their hands to any labour whatsoever, rather than observe religious rules about permitted duties. Initially, Mayo and Mackay's proposal was supported by the press, and Australian landowners seriously considered the proposition. India's colonisation was exacerbating famine and widespread poverty, so the indenture system was talked about in the papers not as exploiting poor, helpless savages, but as transporting starving men out of their unbearable conditions. However, the scheme did have opponents in the British Parliament. Critics such as Sir William Molesworth argued Indians were too ignorant to consent to being labourers, describing indenture as a new species of slave trade. In 1838, news of such concerns reached New South Wales, hampering Mayo and Mackay's proposal. At this point, the debate on indenture in Australia had started to turn xenophobic. Papers wrote about multitudes of Oriental pagans mingling their swarthy faces and foreign jargon and creating degenerate progeny. The inherent racial qualities Mayo and Mackay cited were now being used as reasons not to support indenture. Racial fears and similarities to slavery affected indenture support in Australia, and no government subsidy was put in place. But this didn't stop landowners from starting committees and organisations to fund and investigate indenture themselves. William Charles Wentworth transported and employed hundreds of indentured labourers to try and rescue his estate from bankruptcy. He spent significant efforts in the 1840s and 50s campaigning for indentured labour in the New South Wales Legislative Council, leading the 1842 Cooley Association and attending the 1848 Indian Labour Association of Moreton Bay. Today, he's best known as a founder of the University of Sydney. Estate owner Charles Princip tried for 40 years to establish a major trade empire exploiting India's proximity to Australia, with indenture at the heart of this scheme. He was part of the 1837 Australia Association, which raised 38,000 rupees from wealthy Calcutta investors, including industrialist Dwarknath Tagore, to send labour to Australia. Of course, alongside indenture's dwindling support, the cost and difficulty of transporting labourers across the Indian Ocean meant that this vision never gained traction. The debate over indenture in Australia continued well beyond the 1850s and is seen as one of the precursors to the white Australia policy. But when it comes to when and how many labourers were brought to Australia, information is vague. One historian estimates 250 Indians were brought to Australia between 1835 and 1854. Another says 1,200 labourers were brought to Sydney in 1838. 
Regardless of the numbers, life was difficult for these Indian labourers. Though promises were made about wages and living conditions in their girmet or agreement, these conditions were rarely fulfilled. There are countless stories of Indian labourers being crammed onto ships like cattle, toiling under the burning sun, being underfed and beaten. Many of them were coerced or duped into indenture, and many tried to run away. In 1838, 13 labourers fled from a distillery in Glenmore seven weeks after they were brought to Sydney, hoping to reach India. Captured and taken to court, the labourers said they'd been starved and worked for two weeks without being paid. An article published at the time also notes the tattered remains of clothing they had on. Their contractor John Mackay, who had brought on the arrest warrant for absconding, dropped these charges and agreed to improve their conditions. Mackay also explained to the court that the labourers were working off a debt. He said, as their master, he would coerce them as he saw proper. What's interesting is how the court accepted this, despite Mackay never showing their contracts. This instance shows the contradictions within British law, which prided itself on equality and saw the labourers as British subjects, but elevated the word of the privileged classes. This principle of equality before the law also rubs against their view of certain races as ignorant and better suited for work. Ultimately, it unpicks any justification of indenture as an alternative to slavery. Though indenture didn't catch on in Australia at the same scale as other colonies like Mauritius or Fiji, Australia is still very much involved in this dark chapter of Indian colonial history. The Indian indentured labour system persisted until the 1920s. Over 90 years, almost 1.6 million Indians were transported to British colonies all across the world, so many of whom never found their way back home. This history is still visible today, in everything from Fiji bark to Demerara sugar. This displacement is still felt by their descendants today, who grapple with their sense of belonging within the diaspora. But this period's legacy is also one of resilience, of a strong community of proud, hyphenated identities, of ancestors who made the most out of harrowing circumstances, and of their descendants who continue to accomplish. It's a reminder that history is never just in the past. Thanks for watching Linking History. Join us next time for more South Asian history in Australia.